undermining all of that when you're going against your own policies, your own procedures, and the goals for the programs that you have in place? It just doesn't work. But yeah, go yeah. go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say with like officer corruption, it is something that I'm just now getting into studying is yeah. how to improve because we're stuck with prisons for a while. A lot mm-hmm. of people who talk about you know these issues, researchers, they say, well, these are, this is all terrible. This is a problem that can't really be fixed. So let's just get rid of prisons or seriously reduce our number of prisons. And they're really, they've been saying that for 50 years and they've had obviously no effect because prisons get bigger all the time. So for me, I don't really spend a lot of time talking about um, the activism side, about how to change laws, which that's absolutely necessary. But for me, the way I'm like kind of playing it safe is we're going to have prisons for a long time and they're going to still be bad for a long time because these issues don't get changed overnight. So I want to think about ways to help officers do a better job. So I've been talking to some officers around the country who um, like inspectors of prisons and people who identify corruption and they don't want to see this either. Like the the idea that someone brings meth or K2 into the prison puts them at danger because you might have a guy, you know, having meth psychosis and cut someone's head off. You know, they don't like that. They want an orderly prison where, you know, and so yeah, it's a different mindset. Um, I think a lot of researchers and college professors, they kind of write off the whole profession as it's evil. And it's awful. And it kind of is. It's just like terrible the way it operates. And there's no way to make it perfect, but we're stuck with it. So we have to kind of like reforming the police or anything. I think officers need more attention. How can we get rid of the the enormous amount of bad apples (laughs) and and bring in some really highly qualified professionals? You don't have to be, you know, compassionate and wonderful all the time, but maybe be a human being treat people with respect. Is that too much to ask? (laughs) Yeah. And I would say that a very important part of making our prisons more effective would be the training of the staff and not the punishment side. Don't train them how to, you know, (laughs) beat people up or handcuff them more effectively, you know, or try to teach them how to spray mace or tase people more effectively. They already know how to do that. I'm not saying drop that from the training, because you're probably going to know, need to know how to handcuff somebody. What I'm talking about is conflict de-escalation, social interactions. You know, what makes the prisons overseas special in my eyes, when I've looked at places like Norway or the UK, when the staff members show that they care about the individuals and they treat them like human beings and they're trained in conflict de-escalation. When something's going on and they don't have to immediately tackle the guy, but they can get him to calm down and remove him from the situation without there being a big battle. And, you know, that to me is pretty significant. I would think that better training for correctional officers would make a huge difference. Yeah. And, you know, there is a a few places that I know of, um, I think Washington State, had their prison system, they tried this thing and they, they call it different names. One of them is unit management or crisis intervention training. And it, well, the idea is someone's trying to commit suicide. There's blood all over their window and you open the door and you're all wearing the, you know, the SWAT gear, the cert gear, you barge in there, you do a cell extraction, you beat the guy up, you twist his arm, you throw him in solitary. Is this going to help the problem long-term? So they wanted to teach them these crisis intervention things. And what they found was cognitive behavioral therapy was the solution that the officers become uh, therapists and they talk in the language of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is you first, you listen to what the other person's saying. So a a prisoner comes up to you and he says, I've got to change cells. I can't believe this. I'm having a bad day. And it's starting to get bad. If the officer can notice that. And instead of I demand respect, do what I say, they say, I see what you're saying, and I see that you're excited. Um, ex- now, you told me this. Did I get that right? And you get them to use words and calm down. Th- they're dealing with so many people in prison who have mental health issues, who shouldn't be in prison to begin with. They need hospitals. And correctional officers have become counselors. They have to do all these extra jobs that they're not trained for. 
I think cognitive behavioral therapy is the way to do it is therapy for the officers <laughs> to teach them how to behave better and mm. for them to use therapy to help prisoners avoid conflict. Yeah. And what you were just describing is actually a, a very important part of interpersonal communication that I was talking with you, you know, about earlier. Um, when you kind of restate what someone is saying to kind of show that you're listening and also to clarify, is this what you're really saying? This is what I heard you say, you know, and when somebody feels like they're being listened to, you immediately start establishing a rapport with them. But I think programs that take an approach like that, you know, having officers that take programs like that and also inmates that take programs like that, um, that would be huge to our system. Yeah. I don't think there's anyone that wouldn't benefit from that. No, and you know, that would help all of society, honestly, if people could get along. But it's uh, one thing that, you know, I was mentioning antisocial attitudes. Mm -hmm. One of these things is that people can never take responsibility. They blame other people and they deflect from their own responsibility. So they get in a fight. They started the fight and it was their fault. But they say, oh, it was my victim's fault. You know, this is something that will get you in trouble. Well, you can have a decent prison system with decent retreatment. And all it takes is one officer to be a total jerk to undermine that treatment because these prisoners already have those antisocial attitudes sometimes where all they're looking for an excuse to blame the system. No, absolutely. And they say, this officer is a jerk. He's treating me bad. This is not fair. Therefore, I'm justified in doing these other things. Or, you know, they're looking for something like a lot of people blame the police. Like, um, we had a case, it was the worst case, I want not the worst, because the sex abuse cases are the worst in children's services, but there was one of this husband who beat his wife, and it was the seventh time that he had beat her up so bad she went to the emergency room. She kept getting back together with him. So we were involved because the children witnessed the violence. The house was a just chaos of violence. And when the police arrested him, they put the cuffs on too tight. And so he demanded that they take a picture of his hands so they could see the little pink ring around his wrist where the, the cuffs were too tight. But you could also see his knuckles in the picture and they're all bloody from where he beat up his wife with his fists. And that's always been a, something I think about a lot because it was so disturbing. But you think that here's somebody who blames other people for minor things done to him when he's hurting other people oh, really yeah. bad. That guy is never going to get better unless you could fix that, his thoughts. You have to teach, but then again, if police are deliberately doing something like that, or he gets to jail and they're treating him really bad on purpose, he's just going to get more into this mindset that he's the victim. They're out to get me. This is oh, not absolutely. fair. So I think fair punishment that's clearly fair. Oh, absolutely. Clearly yeah. you deserve it. That's appropriate. But I do when too. it goes overboard, it's a mess. I do too. I think that a lot of the criticisms against Norway's prisons is that there's not justice for the victims and stuff like that and a lot of guys in prison too they do exactly what you're talking about they always blame their problems on somebody else or when they come back with a new case like when i was in prison i would see guys come in with a two-year sentence or a three-year sentence and i saw them again many times before i got out you know I'm like so what, what happened did you did you miss food or something and it was always somebody else's fault. Like, oh, man, people were hating on me or uh, so-and-so told on me. You know, it's their fault because they told on me. Well, what were you doing that they could actually tell on you for? Because yeah, you if you're not doing anything that you can get told on for, then they couldn't have told on you, right? That's true. Like personal accountability in this mature oh, mindset. Huge. It doesn't get fostered very well in prison when you're needling people and treating them like garbage. And one thing this guy in Ohio always told me was, they treat me like a dog. I'm tired of being treated like a dog. And he was so angry all the time that I couldn't even have like a breakthrough with him or anything because he was always like, they're treating me like a dog. And I was like, wait a minute, they've got you shackled. They put you in a kennel. They are treating you like a dog. <laughs> On the one hand, I think you need to do this therapy because it's good for you. But on the other hand, you're starting to convince me <laughs> that this is not a good place for you. 
Well, <laughs> and there's a reason why that accountability is so difficult. There's multiple reasons. But if you imagine that you're in a place that inspires nightmares, there's big fights happening. You know, people getting stabbed, people getting raped. You always have to look over your shoulder. It is very difficult to accept the fact that it's your fault that you're there because you feel like you created that environment. And so it's so much easier to deny that by deflecting onto somebody else or circumstances or something else. Because the reality of it is so hard to face and then say, I did this. I put myself here. That is a very, very tough pill to swallow, especially when you're looking at it every single day. Some guys can do it, and a lot of guys never do. Yeah, I, there was a great quote when I was researching my book on looking into like the, the history of solitary confinement. And there's this quote from a, a, a Catholic bishop. And he was in, in back in the Middle Ages. He's in, you know, inspecting the, the monasteries where the monks are all locked up in their cells. And they would lock them in there for years and years. And he said, based on my observations, if you ever had somebody who was so bad, so sinful, that two years couldn't fix them, then you're not going to be able to fix them with more than two years. You can only make them worse. And that, I was like, wow, this is like wisdom from the Middle Ages. For hundreds of years, they've known that long terms of this ridiculous punishment, incarcerating someone, separating them from other people, human beings just aren't meant for that. Prison is a weird thing. It's like it was, it's a, an abnormal thing. It is, and it's relatively new, you know, from a, uh, from a historical perspective. We didn't used to lock people up for, you know, years and years and years, decades, et cetera, before you would be incarcerated while you're waiting for a sentence to be handed down. You know, you might be whipped, you might be beaten, you might have a hand cut off, you might be thrown in, you know, uh, the stocks for people to throw fruit and stuff at you. And when, you know, we started our new nation, we decided to find a new way to punish people. But um, it's not very normal and it's not historical to what we've done in the past I'm not saying that the other things that we've done in the past were good or bad it's just not natural at all That's but exactly tell me right. i think we've covered rehabilitation very well and i really appreciate your insight on that but i want to hear a little bit about your book so what are what are you writing about and Tell me about the significance of it from your point of view. Absolutely. I'd love to. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been, I've been working on it for a long time and I'm not sure when it'll finally be finished. Uh, maybe I'll be able to consult with you a little bit or show you an advanced copy. But one thing is I wanted to call it is um, extreme confinement, 200 years of research because we've been using extreme confinement for 200 years, over 200 years in America. And I was looking back at the old records from these penitentiaries where they would lock people up and try to make them better. And they did, they had the same recidivism rates as they did over in the work camps and the rock quarries and everything else, which is a bad, you know, it was 50, 60% of people were being rearrested, which we still have worse than that now. And they just couldn't figure out why it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, people are supposed to um, have a religious transformation in prison. Why didn't it work? And then they said, well, we'll teach them how to work hard and they'll get a work ethic. And you work someone half to death and you send them out in the streets and expect that to work. Then they did the reformatory movement, which was supposed to train people through hard work, but you get rewards, you can be released early. They tried that. They're starting to get towards the science. Then they did all the weird experiments of their early 1900s, like uh, these psycholo you know, the field of psychology was kind of new. Yeah. So they were experimenting with like Freudian psychotherapy and yeah. none of that worked. And then in the seventies and eighties, they decided punish, double the punishments, triple the punishments. And they started to get, I don't know if you've heard about the Marion, Illinois 
the USP Marion, the United States Federal Penitentiary in uh, Marion, Illinois. Yeah. Where the Aryan Brotherhood members were sent. And it was maximum mm-hmm. security prison. And these on the same day, two prisoners, Aryan Brotherhood members, killed two correctional officers. It was kind of like a terrorism shockwave spread through the federal prison yeah. system. Yeah, it was a they big They locked deal. them down. 23 hours a day lockdown. And that was the first Supermax. I guess you could count Alcatraz as a Supermax, but people were allowed to work and get out of their cell most of the time. Right. They just used those isolation cells as punishment cells. Mm-hmm. So um, I started, to, I was just reading the history and I was like, oh, wow, these, the government actually documented all of the evidence. And as I went through the evidence, I started to see our reliance on Supermax prisons to somehow fix people um, long prison terms, restrictive housing, even a lot of security level classification does not really reduce violence in the prison and it doesn't reduce recidivism. Right. And it has to be rehabilitation. There's no other way to fix the things that cause crime. And uh, so I'm just putting my book together and I broke it into separate chapters like the history of prisons. And then I get to the one part where they were experimenting with isolation, which is a fascinating thing i don't know if you have time to talk about it a little bit oh absolutely i mean isolation is torture and that was always the point except for a little while those religious people thought they could make you talk to god but other people have always used it as torture to interrogate spies to torture terrorists um you know governments like uh, pretty much every government ever has tried solitary confinement as torture against their political enemies And then in the 1950s and 60s, the CIA was funding a lot of research because of the Cold War. They're scared of the Soviet Union. And it's the most fascinating history I've ever heard. They were doing scientific experiments of locking people um, in different types of solitary confinement to see how long they could stand it. And a lot of these were college experiments. They were not really well done or anything. And I don't really trust a lot of the results from those. But if you take a college student, and you put them in a room and you turn the lights off and you say, you can come out whenever you want, but tell me if you see anything in there. After a while, they start to see things and they're like, oh, I saw a hallucination. I'm going insane. You have to save me. And they have a panic button. When prison, you don't have a panic button. Mm-hmm. You're trapped in there until the officers let you out. And if you are seeing something and screaming, they're going to keep you in there longer. So it really, that's what I wanted to do is separate that research from the experiences of prisoners and collect as much evidence as I could from personal accounts of prisoners and scientific evaluations and found that it's just not good for anybody. It does cause mental health problems. I think some of it's sensational where people say that they're um, like if they're in a class action lawsuit against a prison, there might be an incentive to exaggerate the problems, but honestly, those symptoms of seeing things, of being terrified of the walls closing in, those have been reported for thousands of years. You look way back in ancient history when they would put people in dungeons, those same hallucinations and things were seen. So I think there is something there too. But the CIA experiments, to get back to that, because it is fascinating, is they would, uh, have you you seen the float tanks where people Mm do sensory deprivation, isolation tanks? Yes, I have. People do it for therapy. Mm-hmm. They, they pay like $80 an hour to float in a water tank with right. the lights on. And the point was, this came from a, a researcher named John Lilly. And he would get in a tank and float, and he would try to separate his consciousness and meditate. And I think that's probably what a lot of the monks from the Middle Ages were feeling. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm in touch with God. Well, if you're so isolated that your brain starts to you know, make you feel enlightened that's probably not good either. You might feel Probably good. Not. You might be therapeutic a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Well, it sounds I've heard like other prisoners really... say they have like an out of body experience in isolation. And yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's strange. So as far as maybe losing touch with reality a little bit and, and stuff like that, when you're in isolation, I was in one of those isolation cells like they have on Alcatraz in in Lansing, those are MRA cells. So if you get in really big trouble, that's where you go. Instead of just the regular segregation, it's like segregation within segregation. It's MRA, I believe it stands for uh, 
minimum restricted access. You get the minimum of everything. They put you in that cell in your boxers and you have no blankets on your bed or anything like that. You have a bare pad to sleep on, which is sitting on a, on a concrete slab. Now they're not supposed to use those MRA cells long-term, but segregation in Lansing at the time was so overcrowded that they used them constantly. They always had people in those MRA cells. My neighbor, the guy in the MRA cell right next to me, had been in that cell for over a year, a long time. I, I don't even know what the guy's name was. But he was completely in a different world, completely different world. And they would never open his slam door. You know, sometimes if an inmate wasn't given the officer's problem, they would open the slam door, the outer door, the solid steel door, so he could get more light. But they would never open this guy's slam door because he had lost touch with reality. Like he would scream and stuff like that. And this guy believed that he was in some sort of city and that he was a leader of this city. He didn't even, he wasn't even aware that he was in his cell. And he believed that he was addressing his people in this city. And so all day he would be giving speeches to these people in this city in his mind. And he wasn't, he wasn't aware that he was in a slam cell most of the time. In the moments of little clarity that he had, he would start screaming out that they had taken him as a political prisoner, that someone had attacked this city because he was the leader of this, this city. But he would he had developed this entire world in his mind with its own laws. And I could hear him through the wall and he would recite these laws in this imaginary city. He could tell you about its customs and all this other stuff. He had been in segregation in this slam cell with very little light, no social interaction for so long that he created a world in his own mind. And then he got to the point where he couldn't differentiate between the world that he had created in his mind and reality because his reality was a dark, cold room and the world in his mind was more meaningful and more real than the one that he actually found himself in. It was really was crazy. Horrifying. It was. And when I lived next to this guy, I felt so bad for him because he would scream constantly he would shout out you know about how he was a political prisoner and then he would slip into giving these speeches where he would address the people of this city and he was so troubled you know he would flip from from one to the other where he would have moments of clarity and be horrified because he thought that he had been taken prisoner right and so i would sing you know i'm a a musician and the only time this guy was quiet is when i was singing that is so sad it and is think if he was in a hospital and they use your behavior in while you're in there to keep you in there but it's the environment that's making you behave that way you know if they would say oh he was uh, we tried to let him out for a shower and he was he we push one of us or something. I mean, do you expect people to come out disciplined soldiers? He puts, what do they even expect is happening? What's the mechanism? And, um, geez, you know, I was, um, I was thinking here, you mentioned that you were in there for the last two years of your sentence, right before, yeah. and then they released you from that environment to the streets. Yeah. And I remember I was reading some research from Virginia back in the 1800s. They did a thing called, uh, they called it the crack of the whip that someone might get a one-year sentence 
and you had to spend half of it in isolation, total darkness, isolation. And they would, uh, at first they did it the first six months, but then people were going insane and killing themselves. So they said, okay, we'll do, let you do three months at first and then the last three months so that whenever, right before you leave, you'll remember that prison is bad. We don't want you to get used to it. And they had less violence during prison, but when the people got out, they were, uh, had far greater violent recidivism. And they did an experiment in New York, the same thing around the 1800s. They put uh, 80 people in isolation and um, the suicide rate, the violent crime rate from that was so bad that they abolished it back in the 1800s, of course. And the Supreme Court of the United States once ruled that uh, solitary confinement is uh, torture and that it causes insanity, madness, they called it, and that it is abolished in the United States. But that was in the 1800s. And no one cites that Supreme Court case. I thought you're supposed to have like precedent from the founding fathers and all that, but they ignore that one. Yeah. But there's evidence throughout history that when you do this to people, it's not helping. Um, I know some states have mandated you do a step down program. So you got six months before you get released to the streets. You're supposed to leave isolation and go to minimum or medium security. Then you go to minimum and then you go to a halfway house and they're going to guide you into society. Right. They are not preparing people for society. It is yeah. such, I don't even know how they can make those claims. I, I read, um, go on their websites, just pick a state and go look up the Department of Correction website and it'll say, we're going to reduce recidivism among those we touch. We're going to correct and change lives. And every now and then you get an honest one, which is holding people accountable. But I should do a study on that. Like, what are the slogans for these prison systems? Yeah. The ones that say that they're helping people what a load of baloney. I mean, how can they possibly yeah. help anybody in conditions like that? It can only yeah. do harm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was tough. Now, I was in SEG for over a year, and then I had to be moved to a mental health unit. Um, I stopped eating, and so I lost a whole bunch of weight, and they were talking about uh, trying to get a court order to put a feeding tube in me. Um, I had actually got on a hunger strike a couple of times trying to get out of SIG. And then just because I was so upset with my circumstances, I hated being in that, you know, that isolation in that, um, that environment. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. And, you know, so I stopped eating. I just, I didn't want any part of it. You know, I didn't want anything from these people that were holding me captive. You can keep your food. I don't want it. And, you know, just the adding insult and humiliation to the injuries of places like that, that is it enough that you separated them from your programs and your recreation and right. based the, even the basic freedoms of the general population, is that enough? Or do you have to insult people too? Right. And, when I was in SIG, you know, I'm, I was super close to getting out, right? But I was in SEG. You know what SEG is. It's, it's not a pretty place, right? I saw their food as life support because I felt like I was dead. And, you know, it's just, it's hard to explain where I was at, you know, from a psychological standpoint. I, I'd lost everything. So I didn't want their food. You know, I don't want your life support. I'm good on that. You can keep it because I'm not alive. That's, that's how I felt. And things got a little bit better when I went to the mental health unit because I had a little bit more movement. For the most part, it was like Seg in the sense that I was locked down for most of the time. I could come out and go to yard. But then when I started getting a little bit better, I could go to mental health groups, which I appreciated immensely. And the mental health unit ended up having a talent show and, you know, everybody needed a guitarist and I was the only guy who could really kill it on the guitar there. So when they looked for a guitarist, I spoke up and I got to do that. And that was really cool. But, you know, it was still a horrible experience throughout most of the time that I was in SEG and in the, in the mental health unit. 
because when I got to the mental health unit, if I thought it was a godsend at first, you know, I thought it was the, the best thing ever because I'd just been in seg for a year and, you know, I wasn't in seg anymore. I could, you know, get better and then maybe go to programs and get out of the cell a little bit. But looking back on it now, it wasn't that much better than seg. It really wasn't, you know, it was, it was not that great. It but is, with uh, your, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, you, you mentioned playing a musical instrument, mm -hmm. just these, these little things that let you get out of your environment for just a second mentally to do something that occupies your mind. And one thing I've always loved is, is painting, oil painting, painting classes. And I always want to do that in a prison in Massachusetts someday is go host a painting class. And I always thought that would be great, even though it must be said, painting and creativity type of classes are not associated with reductions in recidivism. So it's not, a, it's not a substitute for drug treatment and education and all that, but it is, it does help people concentrate, manage themselves to have something to look forward Absolutely. to. And I cannot believe when I read about these prisons in places like Alcatraz or something mm -hmm. where you've got people living in horrible conditions, yeah. they're suffering, their freedom is gone for decades, Absolutely. if not life. And they just want to play an instrument. They just want to paint. They just want to do something to distract their mind. And then some tough warden comes along and takes it away and says, no, we don't want to distract them. We want to just, you know, grind their face into the pavement. We want them to know right. that they're suffering. Right. Playing a musical instrument distracts them from the suffering we want them to feel. It's like, how sadistic is that? Yeah. You know, someone needs yeah. to do some psychopathy checklists on these wardens. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and there's sadism in this. Well, yeah. And it's, it's not just an isolated thing. You know, it's, it happens all across the country. And it's crazy that it's that widespread. But when you... I mean, when you're in SEG, you don't even have that, you know, it's, it's pretty tough. And so getting back to your, to your book, you know, the, what to you is the significance and the importance of that topic? You said before that you didn't think that anyone was going to read it, but when this book is done, I think what you're talking about is really important and it's something that not a lot of people know about, you know, or they don't think about on a regular basis. And some people don't have a, any choice, but to think about it on a regular basis, because that's where they wake up every day. But for you, what do you think is the significance of it? Why do you think that that needs to be seen by people? Why do you think it's important that people hear what you have to say and what you're going to be talking about in the book. You know, I think I really, I have two audiences and one is just the general population. If it's got a title with extreme confinement, you know, maybe someone will pick it up and they'll read about prisons and they're going to learn what it's like. And, you know, even though I've never had served a prisoner jail term or anything, I'm not a convict criminologist, like all the classic great criminologists that if I can share other people's stories and I can show with the evidence that this is what people are doing, here's how many people are in isolation right now, here's how many people are in America, here's where we got these ideas. For most people, prisons are out of sight, out of mind. And then when someone's in supermax or isolation, you're out of sight, out of mind, even among the prison population. You're farther and farther down, so far away behind walls and concrete and bars that people don't even you talk about dehumanizing someone. It's like they don't exist. They're socially dead. They're buried in a concrete box for long periods of time. Like I imagine like in my mind, I can see trying to think like, where was I, what was I doing when you were in that cell States away behind barbed wire and bars and concrete and stone and a steel door and then barred doors. And where people go about their daily lives not knowing that their government is doing this to people all the time for minor rule infractions, for even for no rule infractions, for perceived dangerousness. They do it to mentally ill people, cognitively impaired people. And there are alternatives. So my other audience, 
is actually prison wardens. I talk bad about them a lot, but they're the ones with all the power. And so what I do is I take all of their arguments and I say, the reason you do this isolation is because, and so they kind of like we were saying, you repeat back to someone what they, uh, what they said to you so they know you're listening, is I want them to know I'm not like a crazy reformer activist person. I'm listening to what they say. They say they have to do that because they've always done that. And I'm going to say, well, look at what the history shows. It never worked. And they say, but right. it does work. If we got rid of our supermax, we'd have so much violence. And I say, well, look at states that don't have supermax. Look at what happened. You know, there are very few cases that they obsess over of gang leaders, shock callers, violent, dangerous people who might decapitate their cellmate. They can't have a cellmate. They mm -hmm. need to be alone. But do they also need therapy on top of all that? And how safe are you with supermax? What if that money was spent somewhere else? Like Pelican Bay is the one in California. Yep. And I talked to yep. four correctional officers from Pelican Bay to interview them for my book. They told me, you know, uh, a lot of these guys, they debrief, they snitch on the gang, they finally get out of, of super, Supermax. And they talk to these officers like normal human beings. They're not as dangerous and crazy as they thought. It's like, oh, you killed someone to get here and then you killed three people in prison. But here we are in the yard and you're telling me all about um, how you hope you can get parole someday. And you know, they're actually human beings. And the earlier we can intervene, the better. And if wardens can see there are alternatives, they're not going to rely on these. They have to know that punishment doesn't work. By now, the evidence is so clear. Absolutely. It, it never The increased punishments never did achieve what they said it did. It just spent a lot of money and wasted a lot of time. And it's just a shame. So that, that's kind of the purpose of the book. But of course, people would have to read it and I'd have to do a good job of presenting that, which I'm not sure. When you learn well, to like write in a technical sense, like a writer, uh, you know, <laughs> well, writing a program. <laughs> I really look forward to it. And when you finish it, I will definitely have to read it and talk about it on my channel. So I really look forward to it. But um, I think that's where we're gonna wrap up the stuff for the channel um i still have some free time